Welcome to Paris Underground Radio's The Heart of You. My name is Annette Deleu. This is a podcast about Hello and welcome to Chez Toi podcast on Paris Underground Radio. Is in this lifetime. I'm Emily Monaco, various modalities fungus expert such and professional as grounding and energy clearing. And I'm your resident wine expert and Caroline Carter. And exploring your past lives. And we both live in France. Over the next where 20 episodes, I will also be interviewing experts in the fields of at Chez Toi, astrology, we feature recipes submitted by home cooks like you as well as numerology. Join us every Thursday for a brand new episode. Go to parisundergroundradio.com for more information. And don't forget to follow us on social media at Paris Underground Radio on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I look forward to walking this journey with you. kale or endive and then topped with a knackwurst, a very typical Dutch sausage. It's usually... No frills, meal, like I said, very simple. And the Dutch, <laughs> they're not exactly known for having a, a lot of flavor in their cuisine. So oftentimes with the mashed potatoes, you won't even find butter or milk or even salt or pepper mixed in. Uh, so I personally like to add a bit of flair to my meals. So the last time I made Stamp Pot, I decided to make mashed potatoes uh, the way I was more used to with lots of butter and whole milk and of course salt and pepper. I also added in a whole head of roasted garlic and some grated parmesan and it just made the mashed potatoes that much more exciting. And into the mashed potatoes, I don't like to go the uh, traditional route and just mix in plain kale or endive. I lightly saute my kale uh, and mix that in along with some cooked bacon crumbles and then top the mash with a nice gravy made of sausage and bacon drippings and then put my very nice all beef sausage on top of that. And thank you so much, Sherilyn. And uh, her name kind of rhymes with mine because my name is, well, Caroline. Yeah, are you, you're Caroline, never Carolyn, right? Well, actually, so it's spelled Caroline, but my entire life, my mother called me Carolyn. And then I moved to England and that was impossible. And then my brand became Wine Dine Caroline. And, you know, so now that is what I roll with. But <laughs> not really. It was Carolyn. <laughs> That's so funny. And I guess in France, you're what, Caroline? Caroline, oui. Yeah, so I don't really care at all. People are like, oh, do you... what is it? I'm like, don't even ask. It's so confusing because it's spelled Caroline. It's always been spelled Caroline. So, you know, just easier. <laughs> all right. So, yeah, this, this recipe from Sherilyn is like super comforting, hearty, fair, and like, I think it's it's interesting what she was saying about the Dutch not necessarily being famous for their cooking. Like, <laughs> yeah, like a lot of it is maybe more like sustenance based rather than pleasure based. Like we're talking Northern Europe here. So I vibe with Northern Europe, but definitely a more hearty meat on your bones kind of thing. Yeah, I think I don't know anything really about Dutch food. Every time I've been in the Netherlands, I've eaten a lot of amazing food in Amsterdam, but it wasn't necessarily like Dutch food, you know, specifically. Yeah, I eat a lot of Indonesian food when I'm in Holland. <laughs> that said, I have had some really delicious Dutch cheeses. I was actually recently in Holland on the island of Tessel, which is like off the coast of mainland Holland in the North Sea. And they just have, it's just an island filled with sheep. I think there might be more sheep than people there. <laughs> and there's actually a breed of sheep now that like they farm in the UK called the Tessel sheep, like after these sheep from this like remote North Sea island. And so on Tessel, they made a lot of sheep's milk cheese. And I even had the opportunity to taste maybe one of the strangest cheeses I've ever had, which was asparagus cheese. Oh, weird. It was so odd. It was like made with asparagus grown in a field right next to our Airbnb. So I couldn't like not try it. Mm -hmm. And I kind of dug it. But my friend I was traveling with was like, no, this is way too weird. So that could just be me liking weird, weird stuff. I mean, I like asparagus. How is it asparagus cheese? I like explain this to me. It was chopped. It was kind of like if you see those like goudas that have pesto in them or like sun dried mm -hmm. tomato. It was kind of like that. But it was like almost only, only semi soft. And so it had this like vegetal kind of feel to it. It was like, you know what it reminded me the most of? It had like a baby bell kind of flavor to it. Nice. It good. I liked it. I'm into a baby bell. Me too. I get a little uh, tomate de brebis 
from my market and it tastes like very expensive baby bell and I'm obsessed. I remember talking about this with a, a Saint Nectaire producer in the Auvergne and I was like, mm, this reminds me of something. And I knew what it reminded me of, but I felt like that was really rude to say. <laughs> and she just looks me straight in the eyes and goes, baby bell. And I was like, yeah. She's like, yeah, I know we get that a lot. <laughs> hey, that's a good thing everyone everyone has fond memories of baby bell so right? um you know what i really love about this recipe is that she took the thing that she you know is kind of admittedly boring like mushed potatoes with greens in it and made it so you know yummy i mean just all of the layers of yum one or more whole heads of garlic yes please everyone loves roasted garlic right and then we have bacon yes and just, yeah, I mean, this sounds delicious. Anytime you can, you know, make kale unhealthy, I'm here for it. Because, you know, in France, we they actually really don't eat kale. You know, it's not it's not something that you see very often. They do have it in decorative gardens. And that's where I think it should remain. <laughs> but in this recipe, I am actually called to the kale because we've got enough other delicious stuff to uh, to make it work. Yeah, 100%. I think it's such a traditional Dutch dish that I was tempted when I was thinking about like a cheese to follow it up with of looking into the the Dutch cheeses because the Dutch have some amazing like Edam and Gouda. Mm -hmm. Their Gouda is so delicious that the people from northern France back, oh gosh, when was this? It's like Charles V, time of Charles V. So they wanted so badly to eat this Gouda, but he had put into place like trade embargoes and so they stole the recipe dyed it orange and that's how we invented mimolette in france is because they wanted dutch cheese so badly in france i love that and i love mimolette so that's pretty funny mimolette is fantastic. so i kind of wanted to pair it with a dutch cheese but then i sort of started thinking outside the box and actually realized that while those dutch cheeses are delicious this hearty super flavorful all that garlic all that bacon and even this kale which i do i will admit i love it i'm a little basic um, but it's got that lovely bitterness to it. And I thought with all that fat and smokiness and aroma, a hard cheese like that almost feels like it doesn't crescendo quite as much as I wanted it to. I was like, with all these big flavors, I think we can end with like really big flavor cheese. And I got this idea thinking about the bacon in the dish. It reminded me of one of my all time favorite cheese invention stories, which is so basically, you've got a lot of monks in like the Middle Ages in France, and they're super bored, right? Because they're doing, they're spending all their time illuminating manuscripts and like coming up with cool ways to make beer and cheese. Never have I ever been so happy for a bored monk. And in the north of France, you have this abbey called Marwal, and a monk there actually invented a cheese of the same name, a washed rind cheese that a lot of people say is probably the first washed rind cheese in France. And he invented it basically because he was peeved that there were over a hundred days out of the year when he couldn't eat meat because of like no meat on Fridays and like Lent. And he decided to invent <laughs> a cheese that would taste like bacon. And I was like, you go, you go. Yeah, for sure. I'm here for that. And so that's kind of this whole washed rind family, like all those sticky, stinky, gym sake, orange ones, Epois and Nivaro, and all of those kind of come from this idea of washing the outside of a cheese in brine solution, or in the case of some of them like Epois, you wash it Marc de Bourgogne, which is, as mm -hmm. you know, a grappa, like a super intense alcohol that makes that one even more pungent than the others. Mm -hmm. And then, so you have these really orangey cheeses only on the outside, not on the inside, like Mimolette and Cheddar, but only on the outside. And this original one, this, this Maroil, is really pretty smelly. Like, let's be honest here. It's not one you want to take onto public transportation, but... Oh, this, this has to be left in the garden. If you don't finish it, you can't put it back in the fridge. Yeah, exactly. Go put it in the garage or something. Get it out of your house. But unlike some of the other ones... Its bark is a little worse than its bite. It's got that stink. It's got that funk, but it's a little bit denser and more solid than some of the other ones are. So it won't run all over your plate. And like on the inside, it's got the texture of almost a very unripe brie mixed with a baby bell, but like on a hot day. <laughs> it's not goopy, not runny, but soft. And it doesn't spread. So like when you slice it, it keeps its shape. It's kind of like chalky on the inside. And even the creamy parts are never going to go runny. And so I think it's got that almost meaty texture to it. So it's going to stay pretty firm. And it's also unique, oddly enough, in that it's square shaped. That's a rarity now in France, but that used to be really common. And it's 
the idea that this is like pretty much one of the oldest cheeses in France. So it's going to stay square shaped, especially in the north where they don't have supple enough wood to make round cheese molds. So they make square cheese molds. And so this bacony, really old style, kind of funky, assertive cheese, I think is going to work really well following like all of that garlic and the bacon and the kale, which when you cook it down gets on this bitterness and kind of the creaminess of the potatoes. I think that something that's salty, meaty, briny with this toothsome chewiness and that assertiveness, I think would work really well following this Stumphut dish. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. When former college roommates Joanne and Britt join up for a hike in the Colorado Rockies on Joanne's 25th birthday, they're prepared for a light, fun, four-hour walk culminating in delicious birthday barbecue. You ready? Britt, are you putting on lipstick? So what? So we're about to go on a four-hour hike up the Rockies. So? Mother Nature will appreciate the effort. But when they decide to follow a mysterious arrow in the woods, things take a turn for the bizarre. Hey, wait, this rock has an arrow painted on it. Was that yours? I don't remember an arrow. Should we follow it? Maybe it's a sign. We don't want to get lost, though. There's only this one trail. Well, let's just take a little peek. What could possibly go wrong? With not much more than lipstick, dental floss, dental floss and their own senses of humor to get them through will they survive against mother nature unexplained occurrences and an abandoned town that may not be abandoned after all babes in the woods an original comedic mystery series wednesdays on paris underground radio Welcome to Paris Underground Radio's The Heart of You. My name is Annette Delu. This is a podcast about soul exploration, finding out what your true purpose is in this lifetime through various modalities such as grounding in energy clearing, divination, and exploring your past lives. Over the next 20 episodes, I will also be interviewing experts in the fields of astrology, mediumship, as well as numerology. Join us every Thursday for a brand new episode. Go to parisundergroundradio.com for more information. And don't forget to follow us on social media at Paris Underground Radio on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I look forward to walking this journey with you. And now, back to Chez Toi. Hmm. I like that, but you put me in a pickle because oh no, <laughs> yeah. I mean, those kind of cheeses are pretty intense. Can, can be tough to pair with a wine. You know, I was thinking we could go a few different directions with the dish itself. I think honestly, a lot of different wines would go really well with this. You could totally have it with a big red. I was thinking like something from you know the Languedoc Roussillon, some sort of hot red blend, but. I mean, I think that would be great with the bacon and with the sausage and with, you know, our wonderful garlicky business in the mashed potatoes. But I think actually, you know, with that cheese, that's not going to work because the really funky, smelly cheeses, they really just, they're going to fight with a red wine, you know, they just aren't, it's not what you want. It's not what you want. They don't do each other favors, I think, at that point. Uh, You really need white wine with some good acidity, something a little fruity to kind of balance out that funk. And so another one that that I think would be good with this would actually be a Pinot Blanc from Alsace. I was also trying to think, you know, okay, this is like cold weather food. This is cold place food, right? Totally. This isn't the kind of stuff that you would eat in the Languedoc, but it totally is the kind of food you want in the winter somewhere cold. And Alsace also has, you know, Munster is one of their cheeses, right? Totally. And that is stinky as a foot. Right. Munster, where you see it in the States, right? So like Munster, when you buy it in the States and it comes in your pretty slices and it does have an orange rind, that's not a real washed rind rind. That's just annatto seeds. That's like a coloring. I mean, it's a natural coloring, but it's a coloring. So like Munster, when you get it in uh, France, it does indeed smell like 
a foot after a marathon. It smells like a public toilet. It's disgusting. Honestly, I, I don't like it, it but <laughs> you love it. Yeah, I no. my my ex was really into that. And I was just like, um, and it destroys your fridge. You gotta eat it in the moment. Yeah, that's true. You have to finish it. And you definitely can't make out afterwards. Yuck. But so basically, I thought Alsace would be good. Because also Pinot Blanc is a grape. It's a kind of variation on Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, uh, those are all very, very closely related. And Pinot Blanc has a little bacon thing. There's always this little bacony thing that I get. So it's like Pinot Blanc can really evoke a like apple pie with a sprinkle of bacon on the crust kind of vibe, which I think sounds amazing. It does. And Pinot Blanc also goes into a lot of Cremant, uh, sparkling wine made in Alsace, which would also be really good with this. I think actually the bubbles could really cut through some of that richness, which would be really nice and definitely would help offset the funk level on that cheese. I really like Pinot Blanc. Like it's kind of random. It's one that you don't see a ton of around, you know, probably in the States does exist though. I agree with, I would be super into trying a Pinot Blanc with this. And just honestly, your description of apple pie with bacon on the crust, like, okay, yes, please. It's, I want it now. Um, But bubbles with a funky cheese, I think always, if I ever am unsure about what to pair with a with a funky cheese, like Cremant Champagne, if you got the budget for it, I'm always sort of going into that bubbly territory. Because you're right, these these cheeses, they have a lot of personality. And sometimes you need something to sort of cut through all of that assertiveness. Exactly. But you know, this is the kind of food that goes with everything. So. Yeah. And when you talk about bacon in the Pinot Blanc, I actually, I'm curious because we're both... American, you are also British. Bacon means different things to different people around the world. And in France, I think they don't use quite as much smoke as we do in the States. So when I say bacon, in terms of the cheese, a lot of people are like, this doesn't taste like bacon. And it's like, no, it does. But if you took the smoke away, so it's almost more like hammy. Do you get any of that like smoke suggestion in in the wine? Or is it sort of more of that salt and meat type baconiness? No, it's a smoky thing for sure. Smoky thing? That's so cool. Yeah, it is cool. I love it. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much, Sherilyn, for sharing this recipe. I am really eager to try it. I think that my vision of what Dutch food is, is probably changed. Next time I go to Amsterdam, I won't just eat Indonesian food, which is amazing in Amsterdam. Fun fact. Well, yeah, you can have your mashed potatoes with kale. And you know what? If you're making kale delicious, I'm here for it. I know. I shouldn't shouldn't hate on kale. Kale is fine. (laughs) Kale is fine when it's planted in a decorative flower bed. Kale is fine when it's planted in mashed potatoes. <laughs> to learn more about the recipe feature today and to see photos of the meal, please go to parisundergroundradio.com. To have your recipe featured in an upcoming episode of Chez Toi, please email us at parisundergroundradio at gmail.com. You can find me, Emily Monaco, at emily underscore in underscore France on Instagram and Twitter. And you can find me, Caroline Connor, at Wine Dine Caroline on all the things. This episode was produced by Paris Underground Radio. The music is A Night Alone by Track Tribe. For more about the Chez Toi podcast and podcasts like it, please go to parisundergroundradio.com. Thanks for listening and bon appetit.